Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where my guest today is Amy Malloy, whose latest thriller, Good Night Beautiful, is a book reporter bets on selection. I love it when an author can trick me with a twist. Oh, I just love it. And we have a master here, as Amy did that more than once. So welcome, Amy. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So tell us a bit about Good Night Beautiful. So um, it's a hard book to to sort of talk about because plot is kind of everything in it, but um, it's the premise is that we have a newly married couple, Sam and Annie, who met in New York and married quickly after a whirlwind romance. And Sam has been sort of struggling his whole life with um, with fidelity, and you know he's 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 known as a heartbreaker in his hometown. And so after they get married, they move back to Sam's sleepy hometown in upstate New York. Um, to take care of his mother, who is sick, and he's a therapist, and they, um, he decides to open open a home office, and little does he know that there's a vent in the ceiling through which every word can be heard from a room upstairs, and so listening happens, um, and, you know, Annie's kind of home and bored all day, and trying to find her way in this new small town, and meanwhile, Sam is building up this practice and most of his clientele are these attractive women who are coming to kind of, you know, see the guy who, the cute doctor who moved back home. And so um, it sort of is this tension between, you know, Sam downstairs having these therapy sessions and then the idea that there's, you know, you can hear everything that's happening. And then one day this attractive young new patient shows up and um, Sam goes to work and he doesn't come home. And so the book then becomes about what exactly happened to him and um, you know, so that's the plot, but there's sort of a lot of stuff that's going on underneath that. Yeah, just a little bit, just a little tiny bit of stuff going on underneath this. You know, immediately, just a little, immediately in the prologue, you feel the tension. Um, a man is missing, which is not what you usually anticipate. It's usually the woman's missing, a child's missing. This time is a man's missing. And it's a switch up on what you'd expect. It's usually, you know, the sexual stereotype. And from here, you get the feeling that, hmm, this is not going to be a book like everything else. Was the prologue written at the beginning or did you go back and do that later? Um, I actually did it. I did it later. Um, I have some trusted early readers. Um, and one of them, my, my good friend, Jillian Medoff, who's also a novelist, she, you know, the whole time was like, there's the tension is missing. The tension is missing. And so, you know, she was the one who was like, you have to set up this crime. Um, and I think I was, that, that feels sort of formulaic to me. And so I was, I think a lot of this book is, um, you know, there's actually like some meta things happening where I'm kind of exploring the whole genre of thrillers themselves. And so I think I wanted to avoid a prologue, um, but it just, I, you know, I was, I was convinced, rightly so, that I, I needed that to kind of set up like, what is the tension in this book? Yeah, and it was so good because it's like, wait a second, the guy's gone? How did the guy <laughs> gone? Look, he couldn't fight anybody off? Like, what happened? How did that happen? Which just shows, you know, the different stereotypes we put on people. You know, Kirkus has called you the master of clever misdirection. And I could not have said it better. Um, I'm wowed by the plotting. And I feel like what you did here was so intricate. Did you plot in advance? Did you have this all written out? Oh, God, no. It was like the opposite. I actually... Um... I ended up, I wrote a version of this book um, that I, soon after my debut, The Perfect Mother was published, I sold on a partial to HarperCollins. So it was, I had maybe a hundred pages. And so they bought the book and, you know, we, I had a year to write it or so, um, or maybe more, six months. And, um, and as I finished it, I was like three weeks away from the deadline and I was really struggling with it. And I didn't, I thought the ending was falling short. I thought the characters felt very, uh, I don't know, kind of wrote to me. And it just didn't feel like that. This is what I wanted. I wanted to kind of, it wasn't pushing sort of myself as much as I had hoped I would. And so I had this idea, you know, and the premise was the same. It's a married couple, they move upstate. There's a, there's a vent, the wife is upstairs, she's listening. And then this idea came to me of one of the characters in the book who we can talk about after people read it. But it was this sort of this thing that came into my head. It was like, well, wait, what if the premise is the same, but literally every single character is different? And you know, what could I do with it if I did actually tell the story this way? And it was like, it was terrible. Cause I had to, I was three weeks away. I mean, we had a cover, we had a publication date. I had sold the film rights to the girl on the dream team, but it was just plaguing me so much that I ended up like emailing my agent. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. 
And I was like, hey, just hypothetically speaking, like what happens if like you sell a book and then you decide you would like to start over like three weeks before it's due, you know, and then she didn't get back to me. And by four o'clock I had her on the phone and I'm like, we're in really serious trouble. And so on Monday we had lunch with the editor and I had worked over the weekend trying to kind of flesh this idea out. And we pitched it to her and said like, this is the idea. And it, she, she agreed that it was a much stronger, it would be a much stronger book. And then she agreed to give me a whole nother year. And um, so, you know, like, and then from that point, I kind of tried to be stricter about plotting and, and keeping things straight. Um, so, but no, it's funny. It's like, people are like, you know, do you plot or do you write by the seat of your pants? And I'm like, I kind of write a book and then I throw it away apparently <laughs> and start over, um, which is not how I would recommend writing because it was hell for two years or so, but I'm glad I did it in the end. Yeah, and I'm really glad that the publisher said, you're writing a better book, we'll hold. And you knew there was a hole in the catalog then. You knew that that was perpetuating a number of things. We'd already had the cover. We've always done this. And I applaud people that put the brakes on. There are authors that have said to me, like, I turned a book in and I don't want to do that book. Like, and I've heard this more and more times. And it's almost like a badge of honor in a lot of ways because it's not what I want to deliver. It's not what my career is going to be. Yeah, it'd be really nice because you could cash the check a lot faster. Yeah, it'd be nice for all these other reasons. But it's the quality of what you turn in. It's what you do for going forward and you know pivoting from there. So, I mean, I don't know what the other book was. I do. I think I looked up the title at one point. So, what was it called? It was. It was called The Hiding Place. And what's funny is, you know, I'm. I don't. I don't. I'm. You know, I'm sort of resting right now. But um, you, I'm kind of. I'm always playing around with ideas. And a lot of the. A lot of that book is, I think, like re-sprouting and you know I think those characters who I loved but they weren't the right characters for that story I think are the, actually the right characters for, for the story that I might tell next so yeah. I mean I probably won't use like a sentence of it but at least I feel like I have some they didn't just you know it just wasn't a complete waste of time so that's, yeah. that's nice. maybe just hold that cover you just never know yeah. <laughs> hold that cover remember that cover we had <laughs> let's pull that one back up I think I can write to the cover this time I think that's what I'll do <laughs> I'll write to the cover you know you know, one time I um, looked up and I said, oh, how was I fooled? Oh, that was so clever. And I envision you wanting to watch someone reading it and just sit there and go, gotcha. <laughs> Do you feel that way? Do you feel that way that you want to watch? <laughs> well, yeah, a little bit. And it's, um, I, I actually have this tradition with my mother where when I'm finished, when I have like a pretty full first draft, she, she, we live like five hours apart, but I call her on the phone and I will read the entire book to her. Wow. And, um, it's really, it's, I mean, it's like that. It's, it's feel it's like very self-indulgent because I can, you know, like, she'll be like, Oh, you know, or something. And then, or she'll be like, what, who's that person? And so it's very helpful because I'm, it's like, I can't, she does, she kind of like narrates the reader's experience to me. So, um, this one was very, was really, I mean, I just listened to the audiobook over a drive this past weekend, which I have to say, like, all the credit to the narrators, this has nothing to do with it, but it's, it's, the narrators are so good, and so for me, it was a little bit like experiencing the book in a new way, like maybe as a reader does, but um, yeah, so I highly recommend people check out the audiobook. Yeah, I love this, a full cast recording, and we're going to put a clip of it at the end of the podcast, oh, because I love full cast recordings, and I love to hear, you know, just a snippet, and then hear what you could, you know, get into later on. You know, I saw you mention somewhere that plotting is like math, and I see that. I see that happening. A and B have to happen for C to work, but D is kind of out there, and D's got to get into the equation. Was there immediate satisfaction when the equation worked out, or did you feel there had to be some plotting piss, you know, fist bumps to yourself, like, yeah, nailed it. That was really good, or, uh-oh, I don't know where I'm going. Yeah, I mean, I think there's... there's um you know, there's two major twists in this book, but then there's a couple other twists. And um, it was a lot of, it was a lot of math of, of trying to kind of figure out like, what is the sequence th through which you kind of reveal the the surprises in the book. And I think I wrote the novel in every way, like this one goes first, this one goes second. And, you know, and so it's, it, it was, yeah. I mean, because I, I did have this chart where it was like, in every chapter, you know, it's Sam and Annie, and we have, um, we have two point of views. And so it's like, I had to, in every chapter, it's like, well, what is, what does Sam think? You know, what does Sam think Annie thinks? What does Annie think? What does Annie think Sam thinks? And then what does the reader think of each of those people? So, um, you know, and then if there's other characters, like, where do they, what, what are we thinking about them? And so, 
it, ugh. <laughs> My yeah. a little broken. But it completely worked. And what I really loved is, I mean, I had that moment of, whoa, that was really great. Did she take herself and pat herself on the back right now or just go, next chapter? I think everyone- well, I think you never know. Like you're really, until you have readers, until you have the full draft and readers. And, you know, even with my editor, Jennifer Barth at Harper, like we would have some pretty like, you know, healthy back and forth about like, I think this should go here and this should go here, you know, the way that it was unrolled. So it was never, I think, I mean, even now when I'm reading it, I'm still just like, should I have done it this way or was, you know, was this way better? But like at some point they had to yank the book like out of my hands and just be like, you're done. You're done. It's there. It's the world yeah. people are. If you want to move them later, play checkers. You know what yeah. I mean? That's it. You can, you're, you're uh, checkers or chess. You're on to it, you know? So I love that you have this terrific four, four process, um, for four step process for writing. So can you just share what your four steps are? Because they make so much sense, you know? Yeah, it's funny. People are really responding to this because I, like, I sort of just said it to like an interviewer once, but um, when I first, I, I did nonfiction for many years and mm -hmm. my first book, I did ghostwriting um, also. And so my first job writing a book was a ghostwriting job for, you know, that I was writing kind of somebody's memoir. And I had no idea how to write a book, like literally no idea. And I was just reading a lot of similar memoirs to try and understand like, oh, there's an arc and oh, there's, you know, these pacing. And I was, a, I've always been a big reader, but I've, I'm not professionally trained at all. And so I kind of, at the, for the first book, I just wrote on my wall, it was like four steps, like get it down, meaning like just write. It does they, not even fill sentences. And then get it straight. Like once you have it down, you can then be like, oh, this happened here. I need to move this here. And then you have kind of like a cohesive draft and then get, then you can get it good, you know, which is sort of like you start to think about language and you start to think about rhythm and then you get it great. And you only, I mean, that's the fun part, right? Where you just kind of go away to a cabin for a weekend and just look purely at it from like, you know, language perspective. And I think I had to keep reminding myself that because, you know, Annie Lamont is famous for talking about the shitty first draft. Mm -hmm. And it's a grueling process because you're, you're writing constantly and every sentence basically sucks, you know, and like every, nothing is, nothing is there and you're writing in the dark and it's, it's hard to continue to do that. And that kind of takes like at least a year for, I think, mm -hmm. many writers. And so to live in that muck, you know, for that long, I think it was just like, for me, like just, it's only one step and you will get to the great, but it's not. We're, we're nowhere near it yet um and so that's been it's been helpful i mean even now i've written probably like 10 books um including my nonfiction, and i still have that four step mm -hmm. process on the wall in front of me yeah it's just get it down get just start you know what it is it's just start and a yeah. lot of people are so thinking about the perfect that they're not on starting and you have to yeah. put something down and even if you throw every one of those characters out or every single part of that plot out at least there's something to work from because yeah. you're walking away from something you know yeah. This is your second thriller. The first I actually read last weekend, which is The Perfect Mother. So anybody who remembers, oh, that's Amy. Yeah, that's Amy. Um, which was a New York Times, instant New York Times bestseller and quickly got you on the radar of thriller readers. There you had a huge cast of characters. I mean, there were a lot of people that you were writing about. And here the cast is smaller. Was that on purpose or did it just serve the story better to have less people? Um, I mean, it was, but I heard loud and clear from a lot, a lot of people on Goodreads that there was too many characters and the perfect mother and that people sort of found it difficult. Um, and so I think, you know, I didn't say like, oh, I'm going to not do that again, but I do think it probably stuck with me. And, and, but I also feel like I'm, um, I don't know, I'm kind of, I'm always, I want to, I don't want to be a thriller writer forever. You know, I think that there's, I, I like to kind of like, Expand, you know, I did these nonfiction books and I've done a lot of narr narrative nonfiction and I did some, you know, n newspaper type of writing and stuff. And so I think for me, I really wanted to get deeper into characters. Mm -hmm. um, and that means having fewer of them. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the book that I'm toying with right now is, is just a one character point of view, you know, which I haven't done before. And it's a completely different thing, you know, the level to which you're inhabiting this one character. Um, so I think, you know, that's, I'm kind of moving in that, that direction to stories that might be a little bit more character driven. 
And you know, what we're looking at so many times is it's from two different points of view or more different points of view, two different time frames, all of that. And I've heard a lot of people, this is interesting, they're reading, um, listening on audio or reading on E, that they can get lost if they're two different time yeah. frames or whatever, because you can't look back and see where you were very simply. And I think that, you know, as more people are listening to audio and as more people are reading on E, it's just an interesting thing to say, how much can you juggle? And yeah. how much do you think about? It? I mean, I personally, I was not lost reading The Perfect Mother just because I saw all those women in my head, you know? Yeah. And it's like, okay, which one's doing this and which one's doing that? And we did the paperback end up adding like a cast of characters in the beginning of the mm -hmm. book, which we hadn't done for the hardcover. And I think that, that that was helpful. And I mean, it was funny. There were there's people on Instagram who were <laughs> like, helpfully like, making these posts about like choosing actors and actresses to be like, here's who Francie is. And here, like, if you're having trouble, here's how you can remember it. And I was like, God, there's not that many characters, <laughs> you know, but it was three, three points of view. Right. But, and then they each, um, was it three? It's like, I can't remember. And then they each have a husband and they each are a partner. And then they each have a, at least one child. So it was like, it was a lot of people. Well, see, they clearly never been to mommy playgroup. I mean, I if you've like sat with Prince of Mothers, you keep them all straight. You figure out what's going on. Is that your own book group? You don't, you like know which one is which. So yeah, <laughs> I was, I was fine. I didn't get lost reading it, but I was, it was interesting because this book is so different. It's not, you know, some people go out and write the same book over and over with different characters or different whatever. And this was such a real change up game that I loved it because I felt like you needed to drop off the grid at some point to go write this one because it's almost like you had to drop into a different place in your head. Is that what you did with both books? Did you just have to have this moment where getting to that great, what do I have to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, my husband would have a lot to say about this because, you know, he's kind of like you, you, you fully inhabit two different worlds. Like you have us and then you have that. And, you know, it's a constant. And I think I'm often more comfortable in like the novel. It's, you know, it's like I, I have people who are like, how do you write every day? Like, how do you have the discipline? And I'm like, no, the discipline is like interacting with like the actual world. The <laughs> writing part of it is weirdly enjoyable, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get pretty immersed and it's... Um, in some ways it's been one of the good things about this pandemic for us is like I don't I can't do that because I have two little kids and like we're all here I mean they just finally started school but you know it's been this I'm having to reimagine this career really because mm -hmm. it's like I don't want to do that anymore like I don't want to be so sub subsumed or you know absent kind of when I'm writing and so I'm trying to do it differently like I'm trying to take walks and, you know, think a lot more before I kind of like, you know, do shorter, because I could write for eight hours a day, no problem. Wow. And then everybody comes home and I'm like, who are you and why are you in my space? And so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's forcing me to kind of like, just ease into it more and like, you know, keep, keep my life separate, which has been really good for me. Yeah. It's like a little bit of balance. If, if, instead of saying, don't come near me with a sharp object because I'm really in the zone. Like I'm yeah. in the zone here someplace. Don't come in the room. You know? yeah. Just be careful. But it is, you know, some many times I think that great writing comes from being able to drop into the zone, but at least know that you can do that in shorter sprints because, yeah. because of what you've done already, you know, you know, sort of where you have to get in order to be able to channel and write that well. And sometimes you just have to move more quickly on how to do it. I mean, I write a newsletter. I do kind of these, you know, writing kinds of things. And sometimes I just have to do it on demand and I will just sit there and bang, bang, bang. But it could take me a lot of hours. But if it's like, oh, turn it in. Okay, I'm on. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. You, you worked on that part of your brain already. You already worked yeah. on, you worked on the muscle, the writing muscle. I feel like after these two books, writing them in, well, actually writing three books in different ways, it's almost like the muscle is completely honed. And I, you know, it's true. Like, I agree, like it's stronger. And um, I'm really excited about the third book, which I may never write. And I think like there's some, you know, freedom to it that the second book, having a successful debut is amazing. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, what every writer wants. But it really does kind of make a second novel then quite difficult. And mm -hmm. when I wrote The Perfect Mother. I, you know, I literally really did think that it was only going to be like my husband and my mother who would agree to read this and be like, nice job, you know, and like, you don't think like I just and it was it made the writing really pleasurable. And it felt like the way I used to write when I was 12, you know, just like in my little closet office that I made like writing stories. Um, and so this, you know, and then throwing this one out and, you know, thinking like, am I throwing this out just because it's the second novel? Like, is, am I just losing my mind completely with the pressure of it? And, 
you know, and I, I don't feel that, I mean, with the third one, I think it's just like, I don't know. I just feel a lot of freedom and mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to lead me in a new direction, hopefully, maybe, but yeah, we'll see. But it's also the, the second one that didn't happen also had, was a lot of pressure. I mean, that was a lot of pressure to throw on yourself, you know, going forward. And my feeling is, okay, what can I do next? I've already proven I could do something over a second time and make it better, you know? Yeah. I proved something to myself. I proved something to myself, you know? <laughs> but, you know, in, okay, in Goodnight Beautiful, the conversations between Sam, a therapist, and his patients is overheard through a vent. Given the same circumstances, would you listen through the vent? Well, it is funny because my husband is actually a therapist. And so, <laughs> <I love it. laughs> um, which, you know, and we, I mean, it's, it's, it's like so embarrassing to talk about because, <laughs> because there's this dynamic between the married couple where they are involved in this like very sexy role playing. And like, the more I talk about, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, my husband's a therapist. Like we moved to the country, you know, people are like, oh, so, <laughs> you know, oh, I like, see a my mom is like, wait a minute, is this like a memoir? You know? And I'm like, no, but um he was we left i wrote the book and after we i wrote the book we did leave new york and we moved to a very small rural community and um he would he had kept his practice in new york and so he was there you know three days a week but then when COVID hit <laughs> he has had to move his practice into our basement and we have this like weird old farmhouse with like not a lot of uh whatever it's like insulation between the floors so there are days where i'm like oh my god i can kind of hear him down there and so it's, it's you know don't tell his patients that but you know he sees he sees like mostly teenage boys and like to be honest like i just i don't have any interest in having to like live with the experience of teenage boys like going through this pandemic like i just you know it's hard enough for my husband like we don't need two of us listening on that but yeah, it is. And, you know, we had this, I've told this story, but we have the, the whole genesis of this book was that when I was like 15 years ago, living in New York, I decided I want to try therapy for the first time. And I had no idea how you even go about that. And so I went to this guy named Mark, who was, you know, an acquaintance who is a therapist. And he said, you should go to my therapist. She's amazing. And her name was Judith. And so I made an appointment and I go in and I'm like, you know, is it weird that you know Mark and I know Mark and he's never going to come up in therapy. He's just like some random dude I know. And, you know, it was like no problem. And then three years later, I like develop, we become better friends and I develop a crush on him and we're still seeing the same therapist. And so I had this idea that I was going to like sneak into the closet, like on my way out one day and then wait for his appointment, like three days for his appointment. So I could just get a set, like, does he like me too? which I did not do to my credit, but, um, you know, so when we, we did eventually start dating and I was like, wouldn't, and I said to him like, Oh, I was going to hide in the closet. And we, you know, I was not writing fiction at the time, but we had sort of had this fun little, like, wouldn't that be a funny novel? And it was, you know, what would you do with this and stuff? And so, you know, now it's, now it's like 15 years later and we're married with two kids and, you know, and then after the perfect mother, I was like, remember that idea from way long ago? Like, I think there might be something interesting to explore there. So just funny. You don't thing. have to hide in the closet. It's like, oh, wait, there's the air vent. Oh, wow. If I had only known that, maybe I would have done it. <laughs> if I'd only known that. I mean, I totally would have. I'm like that person. I would have like, yes, I would have definitely listened at the vent if I had had that opportunity then. Well, I love that you read the description of the people that are coming to the front door and they have nicknames for the people coming to the front door to come in for their therapy session. And then you hear them through the vent. So they've been identified by how they're walking or what they're wearing or, you know, these little nicknames for them. And I always wonder what the therapist knew what time was up. Like, I always have wondered this, like, how do they know? And then I heard the hidden clock, like you just expose the secret of, I was like, how do these people do 45 minutes exactly in their head or 50 minutes? How do they do this and i guess there's a clock hidden who knew part yeah, of uh, decorating all, all the trade secrets now of all the therapists i was like every you know with my husband i was like what is this what would be this you know and i actually tend, a lot of my friends are also therapists so we would have these nights where we would all get together and drink wine and i would say like here's this character let's let's psychoanalyze them and like what's their childhood and what you know what's motivating them to act this way you know as a whatever 40 year old adult and stuff so i did have a lot of professional help with it yeah, and it brings me to its lighter moments as well, because Sam's moved back to the, hotel, the hometown where he was a player. I mean, he was definitely the player in high school. So some of the women coming to see him were like know him from those days. And his dad, the story of why his dad left is just, it, it's rocking funny in the middle of this thriller, because you're just sitting there like, what happened with the dad? And you come back to the story, so we see it a couple of different ways about 
how his father met this woman and everything that, that happened from there. And I feel like that was paced really well against the other tension because there's this really rattling tension going up. And, but there are moments of like complete levity because you're just picturing this guy comes back to town and everybody's like, oh, he's back. Oh, does he still look good? Oh, would you do him? I don't know. I don't know. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. and you're just thinking of like, what this like to go back to your hometown like this. And at the same time, you've got the story of why the dad left and what was going on with the dad. And I just felt that there were moments where it broke the real serious tension that was going on because it made him very real at the same time as there's this dun, 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 going in the background. Yeah, that was on purpose. AJ Finn, who wrote The Woman in the Window, which, you know, was a book I love, he, he offered an incredibly nice blurb to Good Night Beautiful. And <clears throat> if I can toot my own horn, but he said, you know, he's, he actually he's called this like one of the funniest books that you'll read all year. And to this date, I'm like, that's the nicest compliment sort of mm -hmm. anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, like that really struck me. Um, I, cause I think his book is funny. I think Woman in the Window is like part, part of its success is that there are like that, that's a funny character. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do, you know, and again, like to go, to go back to the audio book, um, yeah, like one of the narrators, he like reads the book in such a funny way. And I actually like had to drive to a funeral for like, it was like five hours and it was like this kind of somber weekend. And I was just like laughing out loud, I think because of this narrator kind of mm -hmm. got the humor in this book and like delivered it in a way that was just like, like it amped it up, you know, way mm -hmm. more than even it was on the page. So um, I love that experience of kind of laughing in the midst of like, of tension and um, you yeah. know, I like trying to do that. Well, I also love the ending, which I'm not giving away nothing of, but it was just this perfect ending, like oh, this perfect, nice. like it's a perfectly wonderful ending. I'm not going to say any more about it because I don't want to give anything away, but it was just like the perfect wrap to the whole thing. And it oh, just, good. once again, gave the book a different feel. Like as you're going through the book and it's, I'm encouraging readers to do this, think about what you're feeling as you're going through, I'm feeling tension, I'm feeling fun, I'm feeling satisfaction, I'm feeling this because the book taps so many of your emotions. I will say that I was telling uh, Amy just before we started, I started reading this book and I had 75 pages left and I had a really like crazy weekend, but I said, I'm going to finish it tonight, fell asleep, got up, finished reading it and then couldn't go to sleep for an hour because I was A, thinking about the book and B, so wound up after reading the book. So it's that kind of a story because you, and I find myself, a lot of times you don't remember what happens in a thriller. Do you remember it was good or it was bad? It was like a good story or whatever. This one, it's like, I think I'll be a year from now and I'll still be able to think about the characters because they were so vividly drawn for me. And I think that a lot of times that doesn't happen. It doesn't, you're yeah. on the plot. That's nice. I mean, that's what I was kind of, it was, that was, you know, that was what I wanted was sort of to get like pretty deep into, you know, like the motivations and like why, you know, I think a lot of this book, it, you know, it thematically is about the way that men are raised by their fathers and like what kind of image of masculinity is passed down from fathers to sons and what that then means for that boy as he grows and matures into an adult, you know, and it was like, I think that was what I wanted, you know, I have no idea why I may have wanted to explore the idea of male toxicity over the last four years. But, you know, I think it was um, a real, like, it was wanting to get inside these characters and be like, we talk a lot about like, you know, women and the influence and the social like pressures, but, you know, I think the same thing, men, boys and men go through the same thing. And mm -hmm. it's this idea that they can't be emotional and they can't share their feelings and, you know, they, it's not natural for them to be faithful to women. And, and, you know, and it was, I wanted to really kind of dig into that with these, with these people. Yeah. At the same point, there's this subplot about money that definitely ratchets up the tension because it's a private sweat for one of the characters, what he's going through. I mean, he's definitely sweating out what's going on. And I feel like the different layers of that tension um, brought some new dimensions to the book because we're not just worrying about this. We're also worrying about that. So you think you're just worrying about, oh, you know, like who's he's going to go see as a client or what his relationship is with his wife, but also now he has almost no money. So there's this other thing that he has to be worrying about all day long. So, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how much we want to say about it, but yeah. So he, you know, Sam, Sam, um, he's kind of living large because his father who he's left the family when Sam was 14, you know, for a very rich model, like, you know, has promised him, um, $2 million. And so he's, he's kind of, you know, this was his impetus to kind of like settle down and get married to this woman he loves and, you know, have an easier life of luxury. And, um, 
you know, but we sort of soon find out that not all that is what he had thought. Mm -mm. No, that's what it's going to do. You, you were a journalist and a ghostwriter before you started writing fiction. What did you take from ghostwriting that you brought to your fiction work? Um, I mean, I really, you know, it was, I sort of fell into ghostwriting and, um, you know, like I said, I hadn't, I hadn't taken any writing courses. I, you know, I had no idea what I was doing and it was, I think I just learned how to write. Like I learned about kind of, you know, the, just the, the craft of it and, and the, you know, the, just really the process. And I was, I feel very grateful for it because it was, it was a great way to kind of get my MFA almost, you know, was mm -hmm. that I was kind of getting paid to write and to work this all out and, you know, to work hard to kind of, to, to figure out how, how books work in that. And so, um, you know, I think it kind of, without that, I wouldn't have had kind of the courage or the wherewithal to know, have any idea how to write a novel. You know, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking that the, being a ghostwriter is some of the traits of the people who are listening at the vent, because you're hearing their stories. And then you need to dig deep to see what they're really writing to say those words. Like before you write it, it's like, well, what part of it is the truth? What part of it is, and how am I going to make this story work? So what I feel like is you're understanding character so well is because you listen to other people tell their stories, but then you had to figure out how to make that story work on the page and what to do. Yeah. Am I crazy <laughs> thinking that? No, I mean, it was, there were a lot of challenges to this book that, you know, which may also be why I want to write like kind of a, you know, sort of easy chronology, one point of view, you know, story for my next book. Like mm -hmm. it was um, like, I had a lot of headaches with this book. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see that. I can definitely <laughs> see that that would happen. When you were ghostwriting, you almost had to take on the voice and cadence of the other characters, of these other people, because you have to write in something that would sound like them at the same time. And that's the reason I think that it influenced your writing of character, because mm -hmm. you knew like who this person was supposed to be. And it's sort of like, I was thinking, well, the same time when you're writing a, um, when you're ghostwriting, you've got to sound like that person. My son always jokes, he says, because sometimes you can write something and you sound like the author. And I said, yeah, because you have to drop in their head, like you yeah. have to drop in the head of what's going on. And what I felt was ghostwriting, you were so in their heads that you did such a good job of creating these characters' heads as well. I mean, I think it did help, you know, and that was, that was, that was the, the job of ghostwriting is that you have to, you know, people would say, this doesn't sound like my voice, my writing voice, you know, and like, and I was like, how do you have a writing voice? You're, you're, you're not a writer. So it was always this, like trying to figure out like, what does this person mean? And how would they talk? And how would they say this? And um, yeah, I think it certainly helped me with, with character stuff. Yeah. I had um, a couple of years ago, I read someone had written a business book. And at the end, he thanked all the people that helped him write the book. And it went on for forever on the audio of all the people he thanked. And I go, what word did he write? By the time you're done with this, there were like 30 big names that you write. And I'm like, somehow I got the feeling that all you did was compile. Like there wasn't any writing involved. It was like some compiling of thoughts. You know? Yeah, so. that's funny. So you moved to Massachusetts from New York City in August 2019 before the pandemic was in the back of anyone's minds. Like, you know, this is like, you know, this is what's going to happen. But I saw the parallel of your characters moving from the city to Sam's hometown. It's a big move. Were you still writing this book when you got up to Massachusetts or were you done? I mean, I was mostly done. We were in edits. Um, and so it was... Um, yeah, so it was all there before before we moved. And then, you know, it's funny because it was like everything was going to be done done in March. And so, you know, it was like in the middle of finish, you know, kind of finishing this book and working on edits. Like I was like, let's pack up 20 years in the city and move to the country and like, let's restart our kids in a new school. And, you know, and so we were always like, it was busy. And so it was like, well, I just need to get to March 1st. March 1st is like copy edits are done. And like, everybody's going to be out of the house and I'm just going to read and like, you know, and then it was like, or we're going to have a pandemic and nobody's ever going to leave the house again. <laughs> so, like, Yeah, it's like all those things that you thought you were going to do. See, you probably have time to unpack your boxes. We moved into this house 31 years ago and we have the attic is like really full right now. So that's my new task. But I was laughing because I think there's some boxes we brought 31 years ago and we just never unpacked. Like, I just think they're yeah. still up there. They're like little yeah, that's, sticky still on them. Right. That's what the basement is for. Yeah, it all just goes down there. All just goes down there. So there's a connection to another best-selling author's work, which we also won't share in this one. I don't want to give any way, but it's such a good homage to him. Have you heard anything from him? No, um, no. I have. I have reached out. You know, I've, I sent a book, and you know, I was. Um, yeah, I'm still waiting. Still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so just give him a tip. Okay, if you're listening, <laughs> you should be watching, you should be reading this book. You know, were you always a thriller reader? Did you read thrillers when you like for pleasure? You know, weirdly, not really. You know, I think I was more of like a, um, I don't know who. I mean, no, I was like, my dad is a big crime reader. And so he would always like, every time I see him, he's like, here's 20,000 crime books that I bought from the used bookstore for you. And, you know, I'd be like, thanks, dad. And then I would never read them. Like, he's very into noir and like, you know, detective stuff. And um, it just never really appealed to me. And then it was after like, I think when I just, I had two kids pretty close together and I was like my reading always felt very heavy and like heady. And so I kind of wanted to, to read more for pleasure. And that was like what kind of got me to pick up, you know, I picked up Gone Girl like everybody else in the world. And I was like, oh, like you could have a lot of fun reading. And, you know, and that kind of sparked something. Yeah, oh, here we go. Look, oh, wow, these are really interesting. When they work, they're really, really, really good. Was this always the title? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I didn't have, it, it was hard for, um, Yes, basically. It was, we had a lot of back and forth with it because it couldn't, we, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing. It wasn't mm. clear kind of what the, the name of this book should be. But um, as soon as we kind of heard this, we were all like, oh, that's interesting. Nope, yeah. That's That'll be a good one. That totally goes there. That totally goes there. Was this always the cover? Was this the first cover you saw? No, I mean, it was, um, no, there were like, there was some, there's ma, a, a, like a small theme of moss in the book. And so we kind of decided to play with that. And then um, there was this one night, my husband was like, he was in the inside of our, like our house looking through a screen door and there was this huge moth on the outside of it. And so I took a picture and it's like this bright moth with like this creepy guy in the background, like through the screen. And I was like, oh my God, I love this. And I actually sent it to like the, my team at Harper and I was like, let's just make this like the book cover, you know, and my husband's like, thanks a lot. Like I'm going to be like the creepy dude in this, on this book cover. <laughs> and they didn't like it as much as I did, but it kind of, it led to this, which I love. It led to mood. It led to the mood yeah. of what was going on. Last night I was watching the news and there were these guys in full hazmat suits that were going after these killer hornets in this yeah. tree that I forget what state it's in. I think it was, might've been an Oregon. I saw that, the big blow up yeah. white suits. And they said, um, like this hornet could be coming other places and they started describing it and it was like in the middle of a pandemic we don't need the hornet like we really the hornet that could spit the venom and they were doing all this stuff and I was like really like this is the wrong story and this was the closing happy story on the news like this was the oh one at God, the end so was the most to make you feel good and I was like whoa so the perfect mother's being adapted into a film still with Amy Pascal and Kerry Washington still um, um well we're not sure i think with everything with the um with the pandemic things have kind of been slowed down with that so yeah we're not sure but it was um it's very exciting to have carrie involved with it yeah involved in what's going on um you know speaking of your first book i was also thinking about how those moms would feel during the pandemic like how that would be feeling you know because what i say is mothers right now do not sit there and say i wish my children were still little those of us with older children go, gee, I wish the kids were still little has been said by no mother with older children anymore. So I thought, boy, going back to those people, a little short story about what happened since then <laughs> of them all gathering together would be kind of interesting. Yeah. We're going to take them from there. Well, I feel lucky. Like my kids are at the age now where they actually like, they're happy to be home with us. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's like, I have teenage nephews and nieces and that's much harder, I think. So in some ways we're lucky. It's a lot of closed doors. That's a lot of closed doors. There's a lot of playing games. It's a lot of like, yeah. you know, what are we going to do for Halloween? How are we going to reinvent Halloween this year? What will we do? How will we do yeah. it? You know? Yeah. So this was a complete delight. The book was just a complete delight to read in so many different ways because I think it's because um, I was looking for something different because I've been reading a lot that was more the same and you definitely delivered different. Definitely delivered different, oh, right? You know, out of the, nice. out of the gate, you. really out of the gate. So huge congratulations. I hope you are working on something else, you know, like just go, close, go in the closet and like, you know, just a little bit, you know, because we're looking yeah, I think I, I mean, I say like, oh, I'm done for a while, but you know, I, I don't think I could really stay away from writing. Unfortunately, You're a writer. You're a writer. That, yeah, you, you don't stay away. You just sit there and say, oh, I'll make notes. And yeah, but you know, it's, it's almost nice that you're not trapped into a book a year kind of a thing, because yeah. I think that that's a lot of pressure. And sometimes the books aren't as strong because yeah, it was, I gotta that. hit the date. Yeah. 
got to hit the date. But you have a fun writing group too. You have some interesting, what do you have, three other people you write, are in your writing group? Or the, uh, you well, know? I don't have an active one now. I have, I have early readers that are incredibly generous and will read, you know, early drafts and that. But um, yeah, I mean, I wish I had one because I think that it makes, I think every writer should be in a writing group, but mm -hmm. um, it's hard during a pandemic to have a writing group. <laughs> You can just zoom together, zoom together with the rest of our lives, with the rest of our lives. Well, I thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Uh, Carol, this is so book. fun. It's like, you're, yeah, this, I could talk to you all day. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks so much. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us today.